Hi everyone, it's Ren here. Ho hope you're all doing quite well, guys. Welcome to my room. Today we're going to be talking about how Jungian existentialism can be of practical value to your life, practical use, rather than just theoretical use. And Jungian existentialism, as most of you may know, is the approach I take in this book. Jungian existentialism is also the, 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 the new movement in personality theory, which in some sense says we don't just need a theory, we can also use an existentialist phenomenological framework to look at what consciousness feels like and what we can concretely do in life and find value as opposed to uh, purely trying to understand personality as a set of traits, as a set of characteristics, which gives us a good description, but it actually doesn't get to the core of how it feels to be an INFJ or an INTP and have particular issues and challenges in life that correspond to those types of consciousness. This book, The Ecstatic Soul, by the way, is available at the links down below in the description box for less than $10. All the Amazon websites are included. If one is not and this is the one you're looking for, please let me know and I will get back to you as soon as I can. It's the deepest investigation of the INFJ you'll find online. So if that's uh, attractive to you as a prospect, go and have a look. Right, so most people, it seems, are really liking my book. And of course, this delights me very much. And there's now more than 600 of you who have got a copy and the feedback I'm getting is very positive and very encouraging. And I cannot wait to start working on my next book on, on this topic because Jungian existentialism is only in its infancy and uh, it has to go on. So one thing that I hear sometimes, again, about the ecstatic soul, about my book, is that it's very interesting, it's very dense, it's very profound, so people seem to be more or less agreed on this, which is an excellent beginning. But sometimes people say it's quite theoretical and it would be lovely to get a sense of how it can be directly practical, practical experience. Now, it's important to understand that when people are saying this, they're not saying that they would like a dumbed down, watered down version of this book. They're not saying they're too lazy to read the book or to read something that's challenging and deep. You know, that's not me saying this, but that's what I hear. For something to be practical, to have concrete use, is not for something to be necessarily boiled down or more simple. It's not the ecstatic soul or a Jungian existentialism for dummies, if you like. And I will never write such a book. Well, never say never. I would certainly never phrase it like this. Never say never, but it's not um, a priority right now. I want to exploit the full possibilities of Jungian existentialism now. It is true that this book is quite theoretical. I think it lays a theoretical basis for the practice. And the practice is what I will be exploring in more detail in a future book. But in this video, somewhat of a pedag pedagogical video, I'd like to give you an example of how Jungian existentialism and the teachings of this book can be very practical, practically useful right here, right now. In order to get there, I would like to draw a distinction between the enlightenment or the de-alienation that is talked about in this book and the teachings of Buddhism. And indeed, sometimes I draw parallels between the two. Now, what Buddhism says in effect is that pretty much everything is impermanent based on a network of cause and effect that there is no self, that the self is an illusion. In other words, it teaches the doctrine of non-self. And that if you follow the path to nirvana, you may hope to have what they call cessation without remainder, where you break the cycle of karma and rebirth and you're relieved from suffering. Now, that also sounds quite theoretical. It also has some elitism built up in it because it suggests, it implies that in order to achieve nirvana, to have the promise of enlightenment, 
You need to follow a pretty rigorous path of moral self-discipline and intellectual analysis. It's pretty much implied that only people who are singularly capable of self-sacrifice and who have a very penetrating and contemplative intellect can even achieve this. And if you read the philosophy of Buddhism, you'll notice it is quite abstract and it's not always clear when you're not a Buddhist how you can exactly achieve the relief from suffering in any way that is not as forbidding as what they teach. Now in this book, The Ecstatic Soul, I also talk about enlightenment. But this is not enlightenment in the Buddhist sense. It's much more practical, directly practical, I would say. It's something that can be achieved tomorrow, next week. You don't go to you don't need to go to a university or a monastery to get close to enlightenment. It's certainly a work in progress, it's certainly something that you have to work on constantly. But while you're working on it, you keep the machine going, you can pretty much derive the benefits from it. So what are those benefits? Well, the difference between Buddhism and Jungian existentialism is that although both ultimately say that the world is one and that there's no separation between mind and matter, because you'll remember that the separation between mind and matter is one expression of alienation, of the alienation of Don and I from inferior Essie, this metaphysical view has practical consequences for Buddhism which are very different than they are for Jungian, Jungian existentialism. For Buddhism, essentially the view says you need to fully appreciate this, understand this in the deepest possible sense so that you can lead and live the life of non-self as it is supposed to be the truth of the metaphysics of Buddhism. In the case, and that's very, very forbidding. It's very hard to imagine what it would be like to live without a self apart from maybe taking some hard drugs. <laughs> and Jung is like, Jungian existentialism, it's more, much more like a traditional Jung in this sense anyway. And maybe in some sense like traditional existentialism, it says no, like uh, we should take our sense of self and the concept of self very seriously. In other words, the world may well be one, the world may well be monistic, but for the pra practical you know, purposes of everyday experience, the fact is that we have a self, we feel ourselves as having a self, and it would probably be quite dangerous to try to nurture that self. Um, we don't know what it would be like, so how about we try to work with the self that we have? We can have a metaphysical view that does not teach us how we ought to relate to our sense of self in practical everyday experience, because it's plenty obvious that we all have a subjectivity and that our subjectivity is not only fundamental to our everyday life, but is, is the very basis of our self-understanding and our introspection. So, unlike Buddhism, Jungian existentialism says, take yourself extremely seriously. And in fact, Liberation from alienation depends on a decision that is taken by yourself. This decision to change your perspective from one of existential anxiety, what I call sometimes anxious prescience, to one of existential vocation or vocational prescience. So imagine, to take a very concrete example, that you're someone who, and I think that, you know, a lot of you will relate, sometimes suffers from being exposed to peer pressure and yielding to peer pressure. A lot of FE users, perhaps all FE users, have that problem. Peer pressure is a difficult thing to resist, particularly if you're an FE user, because FE is very, very sensitive to the demands of the tribe. And peer pressure is excellent at making you feel like the demands of the tribe are aligned with the pressure of this particular peer. And 
peer pressure goes way beyond just an ex the example of uh, someone, one of your friends pressuring you to do this or that. You're pre peer pressured all the time on the internet, by society, by your parents, pretty much all your life. So how do you assert yourself in the face of peer pressure? Well, the first temptation is to not assert yourself and to opt for evasiveness, right? To essentially yield to what people are demanding of you and be in this role of supporter and think that this is going to satisfy you and the reason why you think it's going to satisfy you is because it doesn't dissatisfy other people and you think that from the absence of the satisfaction of other people satisfaction will accrue to you and it doesn't happen and then you try to understand why it doesn't happen and the reason is that you have submitted and renounced your individuality. What is your individuality? It's yourself. So again, here, we're very far away from Buddhism. I mean, if I were to put it very crudely, what I would say is the ecstatic soul and Jungian existentialism express a Western viewpoint, because that's the part of the world that I was born in, and that's my tradition. Um, I'm not from the East, so... Oh, this makes sense, and it's within a tradition, existentialism and Jungianism, that's fine. But mixing the two, I claim, is something quite new. But again, if you return to this example of peer pressure, you realize how to become insensitive to peer pressure. Because peer pressure is never good. Because when peer pressure is good, we don't call it peer pressure. We call it good advice. We call it uh, a useful reminder. We don't call it peer pressure. Peer pressure is bad. And if you're an INFJ, you're exposed to it very regularly all the time, more often than you think, from your siblings, your family, society, friends, non-friends, everybody. You need a strong sense of your, not just of your individuality, but how, of how you relate to other people. And in order to relate to other people, not as people who do things in such a way that you have to react to what they do and adapt to what they do, which if you stay within that evasive mode, you will never get beyond peer pressure. If instead you opt for a position in which you don't try to peer pressure other people harder than they peer pressure you, but you develop the capacity to say no, how about that? How about developing the ability to say no and not no comma sorry? No, not a no coming with apologies, not a passive aggressive no, not a no where you're not really saying no, but you're finding excuses to avoid something. You're actually saying no, and that's all you're saying, no, period. I'd like to ask yourself this question. When was the last time that you were asked something by someone in your environment that you did not want to do, or, you know, that literally you didn't want to do and you didn't have to do it and there was nothing wrong with not wanting to do it or answering a particular question or whatever. When was the last time you just said no, period? And was the last time you said no, period, and never had a second thought I told you you were feeling guilty about it? Well, that's the, that's the alienation for you. <laughs> so how about that? Isn't that quite concrete? Of course, in future videos, in the next book, I'll develop plenty more detail about what it means to be de-alienated and what a de-alienated existence is like for an INFJ. But here I wanted to give you an, an example of an INFJ that has moved beyond evasiveness. In order to say no like this, you need to have very strong confidence in yourself and what you're here for. You need to have already developed this vocation that I've talked about. When you have a vocation, when you know where you're headed, you no longer feel as much like people are instrumental to developing your sense of identity and your sense of worth. People are partners, but they're not determiners. So, like I said, just as an, as an example, as a little thought experiment, I'd like to, you to tell me in the comments, was, when was the last time you said no, period, in answer to a request you did not want to fulfill? 
And let's see what's, uh, what happens. And on that basis, we can continue the conversation. Give me a like, subscribe, comment, and I'll see you next time, guys. Bye-bye.